and welcome to the session on sustainable automation as SDG 18. As you all know that uh, IGF is probably one of the most impactful forums on the world on the issues of internet and digital technologies with 193 nations as its members and uh, for this session of IGF which is the 17th IGF being hosted in Ethiopia and also joined by people uh, live has uh, 4000 registrations from 170 plus countries. So welcome to this uh, forum and uh, I'll give you a backdrop of the dynamic coalition on internet and jobs uh, that has been behind this project sustainable automation and uh, DC jobs was founded uh, as a result of the efforts done in 2018 at IGF Paris where we focused on the fact when during the closing remarks I said that technology should not be just focused on productivity profits and proliferation but we should keep keep people at the core that's the center so with that in mind we formed DC jobs as it's called in the uh, IGF terminology and our focus is on leveraging internet for creating jobs across sectors across geographies uh, for those of you who have worked I see my fellow panelists uh, this is the report that we are releasing today the uh, sustainable automation as SDG 18 and uh, the reason we do this and uh, they use the term sustainable automation is that we need to consider whether we need to indiscriminately use automation or discreetly use automation and that's I think one of our big reasons and what we have done in this report is we have looked at countries large small we have looked at sectors right from agriculture to manufacturing retail services we have also looked at professions which professions are getting automated and what's the result so we have some startling numbers you know and when we get into this discussion with our expert panelists today online and even in the audience is that like if you think country like Brazil 58% of the jobs will be automated if you look at the informal sector 68% of the jobs will be gone McKinsey says 400 million jobs in 46 countries will be lost by 2030 the year we are going to look at completion of SDGs and if you look at the top five tech companies their market cap is equivalent to the the GDP of 157 nations and that that tells you the divide that we are creating with technology and 47% of the US labor force will be under threat because of automation if you look at agriculture in 20th century in America 30 million people were in agriculture and now there are 300,000 so just imagine 30 million to 300,000 that's a huge uh, fall in manufacturing 63% of all occupations and 30% of the tasks will get automated. So that's some of the numbers if you look at the household chores, 90% of them can be done by robots. And when it comes to retail, which is probably one of the fastest growing sectors, that there 53% of all retail activities have a potential to be automated. So this report has extensively covered that. I would say, of course, the data is uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt worldwide for sectors so but still I would say it's uh, representative and in indicative of that and even if you look at healthcare so we mentioned you know people keep questioning will technology replace doctors so I'll just give you a small snapshot of the MRCGP exam conducted in the UK when chatbot took that exam they scored 81% versus actual doctor scoring just 72% I think gives us a sense of where the future is and if I look back, this is not something new that we are seeing for last 10, 20 years. In fact, John Maynard Keynes in 1930 said, the increase of technical efficiency has been taking place faster than the, we can deal with the problem of labor absorption. We've been knowing it for almost close to a century. But it's now that we are seeing the impact. So to discuss this, what we have done is, today we have got a panel and uh, I see almost all minus one online which happens because it is a hybrid more and still I believe that even if we look at technology human intervention will still be needed so I have with me uh, today uh, Gunjan Gunjan Sena is among the pioneers in internet space and uh, is executive chairman of matrix scheme based in uh, uh, San Francisco Mr. Puranchand Pandey is from Taiwan with over two decades of experience was on the board of World Food Program has got accolades from UN, has been working on various projects, is a former CEO of the Dialogue of Civilizations Research Institutes on the Nobel Prize winning World Food Program Board 
and he is currently the visiting fellow, international fellow at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. And uh, we have Ashish Thakur, who is from Nepal, is the executive director of Local Works on Upskilling. We have uh, Rishi Mohan, Dr. Rishi Mohan Bhatnagar, who is an author of the first book on enterprise IoT, was the former global delivery head at a tech company, and also the president and member of the board of Aries Communication. We have Mr. Suresh Adho, who is the deputy head at the Secretary General Office Commonwealth. And uh, he was formerly the OSD to the President of India and also formerly with World Bank in Washington, D.C. So we have quite a distinguished panel and Rahatul Jana from London who worked on this project that we're releasing today. So we have panel from across the world and we are going to shoot the questions to them starting with, uh, I don't see Gunjan, so I'm just going to move to uh, Dr. Rishi Mohan Bhatnagar. Rishi, you are the chairman of the IoT panel and will automation lead to net job creation or job loss and what is your suggestion to the policy makers and the industry and uh, given the massive layoffs that we have seen in the last month or so would like to hear your views on that and if my panelists can keep their views for five or six minutes initially then we can go back in the next round thank you so i'll try to put it in uh, five minutes uh, Rajendri. thank you very much for inviting me it's a pleasure and honor to be here so in 1800s, uh, Rajanji, when the uh, industrial revolution started in the Western world, all the people who spin the wheel in India lost their jobs. Okay? So whenever there's a technology change and whenever there's a technology advancement, there will be a transformation, there will be a disruption. I'm sure you know many of us who have some Indian origin will remember that in 1986, when uh, computerization of uh, Railways was initiated in India. There was a huge, huge uh, protest throughout the country. And people were saying that we should not get computerization. The answer is that technology will not stop. We'll have to change ourselves. And today, the, uh, you know, the huge export of IT that happens from India and the huge amount of jobs that get created in India because of the IT is a result of that revolution that started at that time. So my answer is, uh, first, we need to segregate between the current layoffs in the technology companies with the uh, automation. If you see the kind of layoffs that are happening that are more because of the cost, you know, the growth at any cost. What was the business model? Was it a cash flow? Was people taking money out of the kind of investments they had made? As a result, they had to stop and they had to lay off. The answer to the second thing, whenever there is a transformation, whenever there is a disruption, there will be a change in the skills required and there will be futuristic skills that will be required. There can be a lull where there can be job losses and people will be not knowing what to do. Okay? But there will be new kind of jobs that will be created. There will be new kind of opportunities and the business models that will be created. We should never forget that the human mind is very mature and it is trying to identify things for themselves and they'll be able to do things uh, which will be beneficial for us. We do not want humans to go into a drain and clean the drainage. That let the robot do it. And so we will definitely require different kind of jobs to be done by the new technological things. And uh, <clears throat> so first, the loss of job layoffs that are happening throughout the world in the technology area to me, are not immediate because of the automation, but lack of business model, lack of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the growth at any cost. You know, I just want to grow at any cost. And that has resulted into the bubble getting uh, busted. Uh, whenever there will be new technologies, new futuristic technologies, there will be new kind of jobs that will be created. There will be new skills that will be required. People need to be ready for unskilling and skilling themselves for the new jobs. We have a forum, uh, Rajinaji, where we are working towards uh, the future of future of future jobs. What is the future job? While we are talking about automation, we are talking about how many skills will not be required. Uh, three, 30 million farmers moving towards only 300K. Okay. Where that 2.7 million went? What are the new kind of jobs that got created? What are the new kind of business models that were generated is something which we, I think, you know, we should also think of. And for the policymaker, the last part of your question, uh, Ranjri, 
because there is futuristic job with the new technologies how to skill people in one of the states in india there are 50000 drone operators who are getting skilled okay and these drones will be um, you know checking the palms for insects for pests and they will be giving reports back to the uh, centralized location so what i'm trying to say how many people might have thought that in the rural area there will be 50000 drone skilled resources that will be required okay and many of them might not be very technically educated but now they are getting trained and skilled for drone management and drone uh, operations so what i'm trying to say there will be new and latest jobs that will be created the policy makers have to start thinking that they will not be able to stop the technology you know in india rajendri we all know that the startup india stand up india skill india all those kind of policies and the initiatives the government has taken just to ensure that the people will get themselves trained and skilled for the futuristic jobs uh, that's my advice to the policy makers that they have to start thinking about the future jobs and skilling resources and creating the capacity for futuristic jobs that will be there i pause myself here i have taken 5 minutes and uh, i'll whenever there'll be another question i'll be happy to answer can of the layoffs versus the historical transformation that happens on technology let me move from uh, india to the neighborhood to nepal and ashish thakur is from nepal so nepal has a population of about 30 million out of which 1/5 is youth and uh, internet users are only about 11.51 million so what is the ground level scenario for automation in nepal and what's the future of automation and jobs in nepal given ashish that you're also in upskilling through your initiatives would like to hear from you inviting and giving us a chance to speak uh, as you have notedly said about nepal i would uh, be um, sticking to that and ensuring in terms of automation there has been a lot of works which is been going on in terms of automations in all different sectors whether it be hospitality or it be uh, the finance or or anything as such and we have seen a very good leap in few of these industries where automation has really helped uh, in terms of the industry for example uh, the financial uh, transactions the automation in financial transactions through the use of all these technology have made a lot of ease in 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 lot of sense for banking as well but at the same time as we are talking about jobs and future of jobs as well uh, it is uh, cutting it is helping in also cutting down jobs in terms of industry it is good but at the same time what i would like to relate it to is as a part of uh, uh, research which was done by unicef back in 2019 we said that more than half of the students would come out of the schools without the skills needed for future jobs by 2030 and which we are seeing a very big relevance these days where the working population gap is also much bigger in nepal it's not just about the skills but also the people availability in nepal where we are not having adequate number of uh, working population in nepal where they are going to different other countries and working for obvious reasons of better pay and better uh, things there but th- that there there is something that we need to work on to bring in people to bring in the working population as well and now focusing them towards the skill of today as the previous speaker also very well mentioned about uh, we need to adapt the world will keep on changing we need to adapt to things and they will and all of these are also creating new kind of jobs it is not just eradicating few jobs but it is also creating new kind of jobs which we call analysts which we call copywriters which we call a lot of other technological intervented jobs where we have to have a person behind that technology to work on i see a lot of young people as we have been running different upskilling and reskilling programs as well in nepal uh, i see a lot of young people who are getting into coding who are getting into designing who are getting into all sorts of different activities which are equally or even more at times providing them opportunities and resources for themselves so what i see in terms of 
what me, what is happening and in terms of how it is affecting the future of job is there needs to be a job connectivity bridge for the academics and that is the very niche area that we are working on we need to keep on adapting as a person we need to keep on adapting for the new jobs as well as the academics need to convert into a more applicable and technical and vocational education uh, at this time of academics so that these skills can be worked out i'll just give you an example uh, it's it's getting hard uh, even to find waiters in restaurant these days and there is one restaurant in nepal uh, which was opened by uh, by some engineers passed out, engineering students uh, who passed out and they have these robots as the waiters right so that is providing something to that but at the same time there needs to be the human intervention when we are going to a hospitality sector or a restaurant or a hotel we need to have somebody who is uh, treating us who is talking to us so that intervention would obviously be needed and those kind of things need to be reskilled and at a time upskilled with a lot of matters so that is something which needs to be taken care with the use of vocational and technical education towards academics as well as converting the the earlier skills to a better and reskilled upskilled human resource like accountants the lot of things is done by system automated but then there is a lot of analysis which is needed for better accounting systems so these things need to be upgraded and uh, we have seen even the government is trying to develop some new curriculums and we are supporting in in, in that as well in nepal and but we do need to learn a lot from uh, as uh, the earlier speaker also mentioned about startup india and skill india so there are a lot of things that we need to also uh, learn from other places and uh, there has been a lot of research and uh, formulations going on in terms of bringing on uh, these aspects for future of jobs uh, and and sustainable automation is perfectly fine but then we need to go and upgrade our skills we need to have system for youths to upgrade their skills and that will for sure help in the future of job uh that is upcoming and that would also increase a lot of productivity and at a lot of sense so yeah uh, for now i'll keep it uh, here and if there is anything i'd love to answer it again tashish is good to hear your perspectives and the point you make about the skills and the system we'll come to that in the later part i'm um, now jumping to suresh suresh i have seen you working with the former president of india as his officer on special duty where you actually brought in tech for the first time at the president's office then you have been at the world bank and now as a senior leadership team of commonwealth you look at 56 countries so how do you see the stage of tech adoption and what would your views be on sustainable automation thank you thank you professor gupta and uh, first of all congratulations to you and your team for bringing this very important uh, topic of sustainable automation on the global stage is very relevant is very timely <clears throat> and um, i have gone through your report and it brings out very important facts and figures that where and how things are happening but the most important thing which which i find from your book is about the shift of power the shift of power from the government sector to the private sector you have rightly pointed out in your report that how the the capitalization market capitalization of the apples and many of the companies are much much higher than many of the countries combined together if you put the number 179 something like that so this brings a perspective that how much control the governments have on the sustainable automation whether they can they can define the directions whether they can decide where they want the automation or where they do not want the automation so that's a big question mark particularly if you look at the the requirement of the governments for the resources from the international organization from the private sectors so that limits the ability of the government to decide and further if you look at the foreign direct investment which are coming to the countries i think the game there the countries have no control some of the countries barring few countries who can decide where they want the investment whether in in high end manufacturing low end manufacturing trading services whatever so that's a control which probably has shifted uh from the government to the private sector is the private sector which decide 
where they want to go and they are able to change the policy and 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 do the business in the cross border scenario to that extent so now the question is that if the private sector has the power then then who is going to decide what what should be the level of automation the government can decide its own own processes and procedures like i did as you recall rightly said i did the complete automation in the president office and 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 there was huge resistance as was in 80s about the uh, the the computerization in the railway the income tax department and the other places so i faced a stiff resistance but we managed to do it and what happened in the process that i was able to cut down maybe 70 80% of the people who were doing the processes with inefficient way so i i got less number of people to do those processes but at the same time here i realized that the number of people needed in the other processes has increased so when i look at the total you know the sum i found that it was like a zero sum game so similarly if you look at the global context that if country x is adopting a very high level of automation so it's increasing the productivity it's increasing its profitability it's increasing its competitive power in the market so there is a job loss in country x but in the process if you look at the the outsourcing model then that company is outsourcing certain processes and the procedures to a country y maybe the accounting maybe the contract manufacturing maybe the contract software development etc so my question will be that if we start looking the world economy as a whole instead of looking at country specific scenario then the results are different then at the global level we will say that the technology adoption in one of the part of the world may be leading to a job creation in the other part of the world so that's the question like if you look at the outsourcing which india got benefited from the bpo or the legal outsourcing or the other services so we if we start looking at things in a slightly different perspective then we have a different results overall i will i will also echo the sentiment that uh, technology will find its way whether we like it or dislike it the technology has the power of disruptions neither the government can stop nor the individual can stop the best way is to adopt them the best way is to prepare yourself for for those changes and now the shift has to be from continuous and lifelong learning to continuous and lifelong skilling so that you are able to adopt the to the oncoming changes through the technology and you are able to adjust better adjust to those emerging ecosystem in the working space and that's why the discussions on future of work future of jobs future of the organization everything is happening because people know that they can't stop the technology look at the crypto people are skeptical about the crypto but look at the 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 impact or look at the the penetration which is happening so it's coming in the parallel to the global economy if not as a part of the mainstream economy so i will say that this is inevitable this is bound to happen the only response we can have is to collaborate and to prepare our young minds young people and the people who are working in the present scenario to be ready to adopt those changes that will be my message i'll stop here thank you suresh i think very important point that technology will find its way whether you walk against it or whether it is your call i mean but technology is going to be here and it's going to be transforming the sector it touches and also the fact that the power is shifting from the government to private sector which is reflected in our reports to like the the valuation of five companies is equivalent to the gdp of 157 nations it's disproportionately powerful now this brings me to one of my colleagues on the panel ratul who actually worked initially on this report she is still studying in the uk ratul what would be your view given the fact that you are doing your masters and you will have a, a plan for your career given what we are discussing today how do you see sustainable automation what's your view on it uh, thank you sir for firstly giving me this opportunity to important topic today so like uh, while i started with the study i didn't know that machines would be impacting to a such larger extent and recently i have moved to uk so the things here is really different automation here is really high as compared to india to find part time jobs like stores are re- automated 
it seems pretty tempting with those automated machines where you don't require any human assistance like the jobs would that were done manually people that were traditionally performing like human tasks and all now are done by those machines so you don't need any um, like a uh, human intervention on uh, like uh, any human assistance so there would be machines to guide you so um, the tasks that were performed manually earlier are now performed by ta- uh, by machines so you need uh, certain kinds of skills to adopt those changes and uh, in order to understand those machine languages people with low skill or like um, like they are not familiar with those machines are really facing it difficult to cope up with this present uh, scenario the workplace so i uh, think so automation is leading to high production high productivity but at the same time people are losing their jobs we are not thinking about human resource we are only uh, focusing on how to increase the production or meeting up the um, like the requirement of human at the same time the jobs that uh, are being taken away and people are losing jobs and they are also losing their purchasing power so this has given rise to unemployment as well as as a student also i'm facing a problem of finding jobs and all so what would be the future if we start implementing or installing automation without thinking of a balance a, um, a balance between automation and human so there would be a excessive installation or using of automation without thinking the jobs that would uh, uh, that would human require so i think the skill the less skill people are going to face this problem if they don't reskill themselves and also automation if used without thinking like uh, excessive automation at that point also we are going to risk our future and people are going to end up with no job will not have a perfect job that would uh, satisfy our uh, potential so human would be overtaken by automations the task would be performed by automation and human would have nothing left except like reskilling at that point so if we reskill at the end of our um, end of our like uh, high point of automation at that point it may be difficult for the dependency ratio to cope up countries uh, like having high dependency ratio even some countries the developed countries who has a good, uh, less population than high populated countries like india and china would really find it difficult to uh, like cope up with this automation phase since they have to take care of a larger population uh, so um, it's very important to think about how to take care of automation and implementing automation on sectors uh different sectors and where it's required it's not something that we blindly um install automation everywhere rather it's required or not and um, we look into a sustainable automation where we would be installing automation but thinking sustainably where human and machines would go together but would have a very good future than what we are installing automation right now without thinking uh, where to and where not to that would be my point thank you thanks ratul very important point that you know as a student you find it hard to get you know part time jobs thanks to automation and a very important point you brought out about the dependency ratio and you know i've been heard uh, ashish suresh rishi and you i think the person whom i would come to is dr puran chand pande whom i have known for a long time we had discussions on various issues including his last assignment with the world food program and it ties in very much to what we discussed last time about the universal basic income do you think uh, dr puran that the world stage when we can indiscriminately adopt automation and we will be to able to factor uh, ubi for all i mean given the big divide we are having thanks to technology which is uh, moving across the productivity divide which is moving to the financial divide as we have seen historically so i think it's a very loaded question for you but uh, i think given your work it would not be loaded I look forward to your views i think you're muted uh, dr puran you need to unmute we are not able to hear you am i audible now 
Yes, you are. So thank you very much indeed, and I would like to congratulate you and uh, uh, you know and, and the team for putting together this very important agenda on the table for our discussions uh, today. I have long held the view that there's nothing right, there's nothing wrong. How to really do things in a way that we could probably try and balance it out in a way that it does does not really cut on the wrong side of uh, the human centricity. Uh, and I have also long had the view that technology, uh, like anything else in our lives, will have a positive side to it and maybe some not so positive elements into it. Uh, let me uh, paint a scenario uh, based on how technology is evolving and what it might end up doing which might mean disruptions at a very large scale, which might mean throwing people uh, out of jobs which they have been doing. It could also probably mean how could it really create disruption uh, in the labor market? And if all these things really happen, which is going to be accelerated uh, by excessive uh, technological uh, application, uh, both in our offices and homes and societies, there could be a possibility where, and this could be possibility, I'm not really uh, giving any prediction, but there could be a fairly high degree of uh, potential probability where we could also begin to see social disorder and cost for which could be pretty heavy, both for the governments and also for the private sector to be able to handle it if it really goes beyond a certain level uh, of uh, degree or point. Uh, this is the downside. What technology is doing. Now, side of the technology is, the technology makes our lives easy. We can do our tasks better, like we are talking to each other uh, from five different uh, uh, places altogether. This might have not been possible if we did not really have technology. Uh, technology is also very important because it really makes very crazy things uh, into uh, pretty simpler uh, kind of issues. For example, if I am traveling, and I will probably give you a very small example of Taipei, which is 24 million people, a uh, very uh, small nation state. Uh, but they have been able to do a lot of uh, positive things, which means that this country and uh, what it earns and how people make the money is heavily dependent on technology. And this technology is precision technology. Where they make chip which nobody else can make. They're very precise in terms of uh, manufacturing of suits. I never knew until I came to Taipei that the world's best cycles are being made in Taipei. And nobody anywhere around the world can probably match uh, the scale, the accuracy, uh, the kind of product they have been uh, making, and the cycles, uh, which are, of course, selling in Taiwan, but are being sold around the world, which brings a lot of money back to Taiwan. So this is a kind of the factual uh, thing about technology. So we should not really say either yes or no to technology, but we have to really remember three things about technology. How do we really uh, try and find areas and sectors where we could probably try and gradually uh, accelerate the use of technology, keeping in mind how technology could probably move and do what it might need to do. Second thing, why technology is very important and I have nothing against technology, but what I would really like to say is that technology has got to also remember that technology has got to take the human centricity while it moves along. And why we keep on saying that, look, we need to adopt, which is fine, I mean, I have, no 
problem with uh, humans being able to adopt to technology. I think we lost him. Uh, we'll wait to get him back. Or should we move to the next question uh, coming out of the discussions from this? Uh, so Rishi uh, pointed out about the lack of business model. And if I combine this with what my current speaker was talking about, social disorders as one of the downsides of uh, disproportionate power in the hands of corporations, which we have seen the numbers in the report tell this story. So Rishi, I will come to you because you have been with MNCs leaving global delivery. No better person than you can tell us what will it take for companies to have the right business model? I'm, <clears throat> see, uh, Rajanji, um, you know, people need to start thinking the best. You know, there has to be a, you know, business happens for profits. And when you are in a mature environment, mature corporates will like to have a decent profit, not a substantial over uh, one. So once you have a business model that clearly clarifies how the money will flow and how much margins you will make, okay, that is how the business needs to work. But in today's world, if you see many of the business models, where I personally have not been able to understand how that model was build money for the enterprise. Okay. And they're more working on investments and uh, getting some more funding, funding, funding. And how will you return the funding? And how that funding will have some kind of uh, returns? I am not able to see that kind of model. And that's what I was telling that the business model, is, if the business model is not there, then the problem will be more of, uh, you know, how will you continue paying salaries? How will you sustain that complete business? Okay. And once the business is sustainable, that means it is generating its own cash. You need to see what is the minimum profit you should make. Organizations are meant to make profits. And unless you're going to make a profitable market, a profitable uh, business, you know, it's not sustainable. Otherwise getting funding, whether it's a government funding or from uh, a corporate, you know, it is not the model that will work. So uh, I have been uh, trying to understand many of the current startups and the older startups and the large technology companies investing in huge amount of things and having no business model of how will they get money generated. And uh, so my simple answer, I don't have a, you know, a silver bullet to answer that what is the business model and what business model will work. But the business model, the basic requirement is how the money will flow and who will pay and why will they pay and how much should I charge so that I make a decent profit and the definition of decent profit depends upon individual organizations. Okay. So, um, you know, in, but the kind of layoffs that has happened, okay, whether it was, uh, we all know the name of the those technology companies where there were layoffs in US and the impact was global. I could not identify how will they be making money. Okay. And uh, what is their business model to generate that revenue, which is profitable. As a result, there has been a collapse and they had to let people go. So in, in whenever anybody starts its business, they had to think about who will buy, why will they buy and at what price will they make a decent profit. And that is what the whole, whether it's a service or a product, you need to think about these. And if you have answers, you will be able to have a business model that is working. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I need to move to the next panelist, but very important point that we will need to be very mindful about. You cannot have unlimited growth on a limited planet. And I'll give you some numbers. Yeah. 2018 Apple was 1 trillion. 2020 Apple was 2 trillion. In 17 months, it became 3 trillion. I mean, countries GDP to move from you know, 1 trillion to 2 trillion is a matter of decades. For a company, it is 17 months. I've been selling iPhones and computers. Now, 
you know how cash raises apple i mean we don't want to you know debate that but i am stitching this point to the point that rahul made on dependency ratio the fact is there are countries i mean i agree the situation will not be the same for country like japan which has an aging population will need robots to assist people to do some of the job countries like south korea will need because of the falling fertility rates and you know the company country com like companies there that produced mobiles and electronics for the world but so coming to you suresh you I mean you are a senior leadership team of a multilateral body with 56 nations at its members how do you see this as a situation evolving before you and are there any thoughts that you have in mind to shape the thinking of the nations that you represent at the commonwealth thank you thank you uh, professor gupta for this question and uh, let me first thank you for inviting the young colleague ratul who has been a part of the new generation and the generation which which will be most uh, part of the receiving end of the whole cyclic change which world is seeing and it also brings me to very other important point that as far as the climate is concerned we have been talking about intergenerational equity that what is available to the present generation should also be available to the future generations so this this also brings to the job context as as i as i can make out from from her experience that is is hard to get the job in in advanced economy but it also points to another very important factor that the job growth and the job opportunities are going to shift from advanced economies to the developing economies the jobs will be there where there is a problem and the problems are there in the developing economies so now the educational system is there in the advanced economy the job opportunities are going to be there in developing economy so how to create a match between the two so i think this will require a great reset in terms of the whole uh, industrialization process the whole educational system and also the mindset that the money lies today in problem solving like if you see now india the third largest ecosystems in the world in terms of the startup because we have a lot of problems so that's where the opportunities lie that's where the profit lies so this is something which we have to prepare the future generation to ensure that they becomes a job creator rather than a job seekers that's a fundamental shift which which countries have to see now coming back to my own commonwealth of the nation which is as you rightly pointed out is a 56 countries uh, member with 2.5 billion populations and a 13 trillion dollar economy of these 56 countries and more importantly which is relevant uh, in this context is that 60% of the population of these 2.5 billion is under the age of 30 so the biggest challenge which i have been experiencing while talking to the various uh, the heads of the government the ministers and everywhere is the how to engage the youth how to mainstream the youth in the whole process it in their own economy in their own country this is the biggest challenge because many of those countries are very much concerned about in the country if you can't get the youth the the the, the you no know, capacity to work the availability of the jobs to them is a big big challenge as per the peace and security in the country's concern so what we have been doing is is that as you know in the commonwealth we have uh, a huge opportunities of trading within the commonwealth countries and that is an advantage because all these commonwealth countries are are having the same legal system the same rules and procedure and almost the same kinds of languages you know everybody understand the english so these countries understand uh, uh, those uh, things in a very very similar manner so that gives an advantage that if you are trading within the commonwealth countries if you are investing within the commonwealth countries you have 21% advantage which is if we trade or invest in a non commonwealth country so we are trying to enhance that 21% to 30% by using the whole digitalization process in the commonwealth countries so that there is more trade more investment within the commonwealth countries and creates more opportunities particularly for the small and medium enterprises which are considered to be the job creators so we cannot control the big firms which are like the apple microsoft google we are talking about but can we make our young people as a part of the ecosystem which is msmes to become an entrepreneur and create you know jobs each each small 
um, and medium enterprise enterprises in India average are generating jobs from 4.5% to 10, 10 people, you know. So that's where the power lies for the countries which are still in the developing stage. And to that, we had started massive skilling programs for the university graduates. So they are skilled in a way that they can use those skilling programs to get the jobs as well as to start their own entrepreneurship programs. Secondly, we have been trying to to reskill the government officials, as we said that technology will find its place, whether it's the private sector or the government. So we can't stop that, how artificial intelligence is going to change the life of the people, whether working in the government or the private. So we have started preparing them through the skilling programs. We have launched AI for the public officials in the, in the Commonwealth countries, and we are trying to ensure that they are fully prepared, not only to adopt the AI, but also to understand the plus and minus of the AI, where is the problem, how their countries are going to face the challenges, what are the hidden things, which are the biases in the algorithm which, which can affect their organization and the countries. So these are the, some of the initiatives which we are trying to work and trying to ensure that the, the future generation, particularly which has the maximum stake in their own country, in the global peace, in the global order, and for making this planet very safe are part of this whole agenda for scaling digitalizations and everything. And I'm sure that if we can do that, we will have a very resilient young generations who will be good for themselves, for the country, as well as for a very sustainable and habitable planet. I'll stop here. Thank you. Here one side debating and discussing sustainable automation, but one thing I also realized that, yes, technology is not going away. So yesterday on the main session, um, the technologies of the future, uh, I announced um, Project Create, which is about collaborating to realize employment and entrepreneurship for all using through a tech ecosystem. Because certainly the current models are making corporations stronger than nations. And you know, they will definitely prevail upon and change the policies. And the point you brought about the MSMEs and uh, the tech envoy of the UN was on my panel. And he appreciated the fact that, you know, we should talk about job creation because that's something that people don't talk about. We always talk about profitability, productivity. So this will be one uh, question to you, maybe putting you on the spot. How would you see Commonwealth supporting an initiative like Create? This is under the auspices of our DC jobs at uh, IGF. I'll come back, Puran. I mean, this question is for Suresh. Uh, yeah, yeah, I will, I will. Yeah. Yeah. Suresh, over to you. And I, I really admire your uh, capacity and uh, the ability to innovate your thinking and come out with innovation solutions. As I said in the beginning that the emphasis for creating jobs and particularly the jobs by using the appropriate technology. I am neither for the technology nor for against the technology. But if you recall in 70s, India coined a very important term, how to use the appropriate technology. I used to study in the IIT Delhi and the focus was that which energy is suitable for India's need at that point of time. So, so this discussion has been for a very long time that it should not be the mad race for automation that if some country is doing, I should do it, but what is my local need? Am I happy with a simple solution of, of the, the problem solving or how should I go for blockchain or crypto or, or other so-called fancy products in the market. So that's a very individualized uh, country solutions. But coming back to your point, definitely we can explore with you that what are the, what are, what models you have in mind and how it can be helpful in creating public goods for the people and the, for the country. Because everything, anything uh, whether it's uh, developed by the corporate, whether it's developed by the individuals, whether it's developed by the government, which has a public value. I think we all uh, should come together and support that public initiative, which can be good for the, for the society and the people and particularly the young population. So I'll be very happy to explore further with you. And, uh, and I'm, I'm a very open you know, minded person and uh, definitely we can talk much about it, that what is this initiative and how 
how we can leverage our own um, platform value as well as the need of the countries for for job because the job is number one agenda in most of the countries. So every country is concerned that that how to create the job, how to create the you know the young people engage in the the meaningful economic activities so that they are not only a kind of a resource for the countries uh, rather than becoming you know kind of a drain on the country country. So that's that's a question and very very um, uh, I mean uh, thoughtful of you to go on this line and please always think that the like-minded people who wants to see a very good world, a safe world, a safe planet will always be with you. You are always very sharp in the words you use. You mentioned the word public good and global good. I think that that encapsulate everything. Now, the theme of this entire project is internet for all and livelihood for all because still 2.4 billion people or 2.7 between these two numbers, whichever is correct, are still not connected to the internet. Now with this, I think the last 10 minutes or so would love to pass it on and discussion as questions. Smithy, do we have questions from the online or even within the room? Happy to take them. Uh, yeah, we have questions online. Uh, first is, what can be done to pacify the mass hysteria amongst people that is associated with automation? And second question is, can reskilling of the working population be a solution to tackle unsustainable automation? So for me to answer, I also served as a member of the Education Policy Committee of the Government of India. The current education system is not in tune with the changing needs of the time. I mean, that's something that we are talking of 18th century education system with a 21st century setup. So this is a complete mismatch. I mean, the four walls are not going to deliver you out of the box thinking. So that has to be rethought. The old paradigm of teaching botany, zoology, chemistry, physics, maths is important, but it's not the only option that we should give to students. So that is one part that we need to redo our education system, more so in light of what COVID has done to us. The second thing about mass hysteria, I think the proof is in the pudding. I think Rahul is one who is doing a master's in London, finds it tough to support her education through a part-time job. That's the reality before us. And that's why for us, this report, Sustainable Automation, is about looking at those challenges and finding a solution. Do we have a solution? No. Do we have to find a solution? Do we don't have a choice? So I think that is where this is a wider debate for us when we look at Project Create is to work together to find what is that route going to be. Would it be a discrete automation or would it be indiscriminate? Indiscriminate, I don't know, is going to solve everyone's problem. But we need to look at what level we need to use automation and where. That's what I think Dr. Rishi brought out, that we don't have, a, if the companies, so-called trillion dollar companies don't have a business model, then I think it's our job to find out. Yeah. I think there's a question in the room also. We can take that, then we move to online. Uh, yeah, my question was pretty similar to the second one, um, but I'll try and frame it a little bit differently. Um, when you were talking about, uh, for example, 99% of agricultural workers are going to be unemployed due to automation. Uh, when we're talking about reskilling, um, obviously it's impossible to give like a proper estimate, but how effective do you think that's going to be for this 99% of people in this field? Uh, can you really reskill 99% of people who are losing their jobs? So, you know, I, I can give a perspective from my country's perspective, you know, where we have a very diverse 36 states spread across 1.4 billion population and different parts of India are looking in different ages. You know, some have the most advanced like in Bombay, Delhi and metros. Some are looking really living in semi-urban areas, some in rural areas. So it's a complex challenge. But the question is, what are we focusing on? We are trying to focus on metros into smart cities. Is that a solution or should we look at smart villages? I mean, that's that's the kind of mental shift. I think one of our expert panelists talked about it. We need to redo, rethink the way we look at things. So, but I would actually like if someone from my panel, I have uh, Dr. Puran Chand Pandey, who used to be on the board of World Food Program. I'm sure he's looked at topic in much more depth, but given the fact that I was looking, I mean, this is the data that's there in this report, that we'll have to enhance our production by 70% to meet the food needs of 2050. Can you imagine that with the shrinking force? There is no 3D food, you know, that you will get without growing the actual biological nutrients. 
unless we try to create something out of thin air. So I'll actually pass it on to Dr. Puran Pandey if he wants to chip in or someone else on the expert panel online. situation, there's a scenario, including that of the shift from one level of technology to another level of technology. So there are 75 governments around the world who are now thinking in terms of how to safeguard uh, these young people, safeguard the poor, safeguard the vulnerable, so that do not, they do not really fall off the cliff in a society, uh, giving a lot of potential problem of the social order whereby then the government will need to spend a lot of money on police, on security, and uh, the co consequential difficulties and the problems which society could probably pass through. So I will really stop here, but answering the question, which is about agriculture, you rightly said that with cost of living crisis uh, taking place and that will be accelerated, as we pass into our times, and people will not really have enough food to eat. And even agricultural uh, or agrarian societies uh, will find it pretty hard to continue to uh, feed their own people. And therefore, on the one hand, technology is going to be pretty obvious uh, when it will be deployed to sort of increase the productivity, cease to add that nutrition value in the agricultural product which is being grown uh, in fields is going to be secured. And how will the supply chain from one, of the, from one part of the world where agricultural produce is being uh, grown or produced in a larger quantity will get exported to other countries uh, in Africa, in Middle East, so that people do not really uh, you know, suffer from the hunger and uh, could probably make both the ends meet. So in times to come, uh, there'll be a lot of premium on how countries and societies are going to grow agricultural products. And this is where I believe, while the jobs might be getting lost in manufacturing or in services, uh, because there is a, uh, an excessive uh, dose of technology, but there'll be sectors like agriculture, 
uh, sectors like MSME, uh, sectors like, uh, uh, you know, household businesses, uh, um, um, uh, startups. So I think while on the one hand, technology is going to uh, dismantle uh, jobs and throw people out uh, in a very large quantity, but then there are going to be certain sectors where more and more jobs seem to be going to be created and we have got to be mindful, and this is what I said when I started opening, uh, talking about it, that it is precisely the kind of the duty of the government and the private sector together to see to it that they identify areas, they identify sectors, they identify people, begin to skill them, and then at the same time, begin to give them protection, which is in terms of social safety and security. Unless and until these things are going to be put in place and put in place as quickly as possible, we could probably see technology uh, not only displacing people from several sectors uh, together, but also bringing a lot of social disorder, which might be a very, very difficult proposition for anybody to be able to control beyond a point in time. And therefore, it is not only being able to adopt to technology, but also how do we really see to it that we take away uh, the downside to technology and get them to mitigate and also create or build to stop here beyond our schedule. So just 10 seconds to everyone on this important question is like all my panelists should sustainable development go like goals have sustainable automation as SDG 18? Yes or no? Just from each one of you before we wrap the session. I would ask Rishi, Suresh, Ashish, Ratul, and then you, uh, Rishi. Yeah, definitely, yes. The sustainable automation is there, and we have to work on it. Yeah, yeah thank you. I think uh, sustainable automation is very, very important, but, but whether to go as SDG 18, you have to see SDG 9, whether that sustainable industrialization can cover that. And, and I think it's, we are too late in the game because we are already halfway past. So whether, uh, whether that can fit in. Yes, and as we said, um, focused on uh, decent jobs and industrial automation, industrial sustainable industry, that is something that. Yes, sustainable automation should be considered as SDG 18. This is an important area and uh, sort of uh, goes along with SDG 9. And as Suresh said, you know, we are already uh, late in the game uh, because the UN system to be able to go back and try and include another goal as uh, any other goal would be very difficult and almost impossible. Boom, like, would you raise hands or hands down to saying SDG 18 or SDG 9 merge with sustainable automation is the way? We just show our hand should be just good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think an interesting discussion. This is just a primer for debate. We hope that uh, going forward, we will uh, work on it. And I look forward to engaging with you. And thank you so much for joining online. Have a great day or great evening or good night, probably for those who are joining across the world. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.